On Saturday, I was standing with a group of friends watching the television screen with the announcement that any minute the president would make a statement, and I turned to him and said, I'll bet the uh, missiles were launched uh, and shot off uh, hours ago, and we'll hear about it now. And to my surprise, of course, the president came forward and said, uh, I have that authority, I've made that decision, but I'm going to respect our constitutional democracy and give the Congress, that is the American people through Congress, a voice in this decision. From where I was standing, that was good news, because for as long as I've been in Congress, House and Senate, I've argued about that congressional responsibility. Some presidents have respected it, some have not. Most of the time, Congress, in writing or in speeches, insists on being respected and being given this authority, and then starts shaking when it's given, because it calls on us to be part of historic life and death decisions. It's one of the toughest calls we'll ever make as members of Congress, but I salute the President for respecting the Constitution and giving us that responsibility, and I think the turnout today, on short notice, in the midst of a break, on this committee, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, is an indication that we're taking this seriously and solemnly. I'll also note to uh, Senator Kerry and also uh, to Part Secretary Kerry and uh, Secretary Hagel, we all served together some 12 years ago and faced similar awesome historic decisions related to Iraq and Afghanistan. We saw those differently in some respects, but I voted against the Iraqi resolution in going to war in that country and felt that the events that transpired afterwards gave me some justification for my vote. But I voted for the war in Afghanistan, believing that it was a clear response to 9-11. We were going after those responsible for killing 3,000 innocent Americans, and we were going to make them pay a price. I still believe that was the right thing to do. But I didn't know at the time that I voted for that authorization for the use of military force, I was voting for the longest war in the history of the United States and an authority to several presidents to do things that I, no one ever could have envisioned at that moment in history. So Secretary Kerry and Secretary Hagel, I take this very seriously. I understand this president, I understand his values. But I take it very seriously that the language be as precise as possible when it comes to this whole question of expanding this mission into something much larger, something that would engage us in a new level of warfare or a new authority for this president or a future president. So I hope that we can have your word and assurance that we can work together in a bipartisan fashion to craft this in a way that it carefully achieves our goal but does not expand authority anywhere beyond what is necessary. Uh, Senator, thank you. Very important statement. And you not only have my word uh, that it will not do that, but we will work with you very, very closely with the White House in, uh, in shaping this uh, resolution. Uh, we, there, there's no uh, hidden agenda. There's no... Uh, subterfuge, there's no uh, surrogate strategy here. There's one objective, and that objective is to make sure we live up to our obligations of upholding the norm with respect to international behavior on the use of chemical weapons, and that is what the President is seeking in this authorization. Let me speak to the issue of chemical weapons. I don't know if General Dempsey or Secretary Hagel or perhaps Sec Secretary Kerry is the appropriate person. The French have done an assessment of what they believe the Syrians have in terms of their chemical weapons arsenal. General Dempsey, are you familiar with it? I'm not familiar with the French assessment. I'm familiar with our own. Well, let me ask, we have it here, a copy of it here, and it's been published. And we have talked a lot about sarin gas and other nerve agents. And what we hear from this report, and I'd ask you if it's close to what your assessment is, the Syrians have more than 1,000 tons of chemical agents and precursor chemicals, several hundred tons of sarin, representing the bulk of their arsenal. It's also been speculated that they have the missile capability of delivering these chemical weapons in Israel, portions of Turkey, 
Jordan, Iraq, and beyond. What is your assessment of their potential when it comes to the delivery and their capacity when it comes to the amount of chemical agents they have available? Our assessment very closely matches the French assessment. I guess my question to you, Mr. Secretary, Secretary Kerry, is in light of the vulnerability of these countries, what has been the response of the Arab and Muslim world to this? I mean, you've listed four or five who've stepped forward to say they support our efforts. It would seem that if this danger in the region is so profound that we would have even greater support. Uh, Senator, I think th this is something I'd be happier discussing in greater detail with you in the closed session. There are, there are obviously uh, some countries for whom public statements are more complicated than others, and I think we should talk about that at the other session. Fair enough. Uh, General Dempsey, we saw these photographs earlier, these heartbreaking photographs. Page three of the Washington Post uh, this morning, an ad by a group supporting the President's effort, has a photograph that's riveted in my mind as a father and grandfather of the children on the floor in shrouds, victims of this chemical agent and gas attack. What the administration is asking us for is military authority to launch additional attacks. What have you been charged with in terms of the issue of collateral damage uh, from those attacks as it would affect innocent people and civilians in the nation of Syria? Senator, the, the guidance that we've received on targeting is to maintain a collateral damage estimate of low. And I just briefly on how we come up with our assessments of collateral damage, it's based on how much we know about a target through intelligence, its proximity to civilian structures, and weapons effects as we decide what weapon to weaponeer against it. And a, and a a collateral damage estimate of low means just that, that we will keep collateral damage uh, lower than a certain number, which I would rather share with you in a classified setting. That doesn't mean, by the way, that we would uh, uh, have the same constraint, if you will, in what damage could be done to regime personnel. So that's a separate issue, although even in, in that case, I could probably tell you some more things in the classified setting. I look forward to that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.